Hey everybody, my name is Kyla. Welcome to my channel where I talk about the stock market and the economy, amongst other things. Today I'm going to be talking about pumpkin policy, the Federal Reserve, and basically what is going on with the US dollar. The too long didn't watch of this video, if you just watch until this point, give it a thumbs up, is that the Federal Reserve is the main gardener of the markets and the economy, and they are going to carve faces into the ghost of pumpkins to scare away the inflation ghost. Something like that. But basically, the, the whole reason that I'm talking about pumpkin policy is because the Federal Reserve's wallers had this really beautiful statement when e-dressing liquidity in treasury markets. A lot of people complain about treasury market strains and liquidity. A lot of people complain about treasuries aren't liquid. What does that mean? It means people aren't willing to pay the price that you're selling at. Okay, well, lower the price. On October 31st, the liquidity for pumpkins is very high, but on November 1st, the market liquidity for pumpkins goes to zero. I'm not going to step in and try to fix the pumpkin market. And yeah, yeah, you are. <laughs> you are in charge of the pumpkin market, Federal Reserve Smaller. You are. There is no liquidity problem if you lower the price, is essentially what he's saying. But if the treasury market gets smashed, in the street by a bunch of teenagers as pumpkins tend to do, Waller and the Federal Reserve are likely going to have to step in and prices are not a great barometer for market health. There are plenty of buyers but at potentially destructive prices. The logic of, ah yes, we'll just wait for prices to fall enough and someone will step in and buy is a nightmare to anybody who's ever tried to sell anything and I'm sure pumpkin patch people can relate to that. Pumpkin policy is in full play. Williams even gave this whole speech a bedrock commitment to price stability, which like what a title, right? In which he said the Fed's commitment to achieve and sustain 2% and inflation is now a bedrock principle. He's gone Flintstones on this market. He states that this will help people understand what the Fed is doing and also anchors long-term inflation expectations. And he also stated that he thinks unemployment will rise to 4.5% by the end of 2023. The Fed has made it very clear that they are not going to pivot. They're not, okay? If you're expecting them to, they're not going to. And that this time it is different, that the era of easy policy has come to an end for a while. But the stock market is like, well, hey, like, listen, give me, like, you know, give us another chance. We're on a break. We didn't break up, right, Fed? Like, you still love us. Us, call us back. And of course, the economy is not the stock market. The stock market is noisy and whiny, but the Fed has to pay attention to it because as Joe Weisenthal highlighted, people looking at moves in financial market moves and taking them as a verdict on the merits of a given policy, it is an odd form of market fundamentalism. Markets nudge, but the Fed does. So even if Waller is like, let those pumpkins smash, the Fed is going to have to come in and clean them up. Fed policy is sort of like a prism right now. There are two main inputs into Fed policy, but the impact of those inputs is kind of like this wide rainbow of chaos. So the end puts a jobs and inflation metrics are kind of wonky. So I have a whole YouTube video on jobs and the jobs report and payrolls data. The Fed wants jobs to slow down. They they really do. They're like, hey, you know, it kind of sucks, but hey, suck it up. All right. And so the Fed is going to keep on ripping rates. The unemployment rate ticked down, which the Fed doesn't like, but job openings fell, which the Fed does like. The labor market is still tight. The Fed has made it pretty clear that they don't see inflation at the point where they want it, but it's largely because the Fed is looking in the rear view mirror as they're barreling down that highway. Rent costs are going way down. Healthcare inflation is going way down. Supply chains are whipping back. Companies have a ton of inventory and all of this will take its time to work through and like actually get reflected in inflation metrics, but they're positive signals. However, the Fed operates their rate hike car by going backwards. So imagine you're going 90 miles per hour down the interstate and you're like, I'm going to look behind me because, uh, all I have to worry about is what's behind me, all right? You're not really looking forward. And of course, the thing is, if you're looking backwards when you're driving at 90 miles per hour, probably gonna hit something at some point. <laughs> and that's the big worry right now. And that there's two big impacts that I wanna talk about. There's two layers to this giant worldwide impact to the Fed, you know, having this policy prism and the dollar in the bond market. So dollar dominoes. The US dollar is just the first domino and I've written extensively about it, but the dollar is arguably just so important because of the economic ripples it makes when it gets going. So when the dollar tips, it knocks over a bunch of other stuff. So there's this little comic, you know, the Fed is raising rates to fight inflation. The world is like, whoa, the dollar is looking pretty hot, looking pretty good. I might invest. And then the world is like, wow, okay. Like we all demanded the dollar. The dollar went way up in price that increased the cost of energy imports and our dollar dollar made debt. Like what the heck dollar? Like you're a wrecking ball. What the heck? And U.S. corporations are like, wow, our export costs. So the cost of to ship goods outside of the United States to other countries, it's super expensive. Most companies do that. Right. And so the U.S. treasury is like, wow, okay. Like we see nations struggling with higher energy costs because of the dollar, we see nations struggling with higher debt costs because of the dollar. We see our own domestic corporations struggling with higher costs because of the dollar. But like, listen, we can't really do anything about the dollar. We can't do a Plaza Accord 2.0 because the Fed's going to keep on hiking. So we're going to essentially be washing the car when it's raining. And that's kind of silly and then useless. So we're just not going to intervene this time. And the Fed is like, okay, well, listen, like a stronger dollar does help fight inflation because it reduces import costs. But then U.S. consumers are, wow, you know, reduce import costs and everything is looking a little bit cheaper. So things being 
being shipped to the United States from other countries, a little bit cheaper to consume because the dollar is so strong. And so the dollar is like, wow, look, ripping absolute reps in the gym right now. I'm getting so strong. And so the whole takeaway from that thing is that the dollar is very strong and that has a lot of domino impacts on other countries, on US corporations. And there isn't much that the US Treasury or even the Fed wants to do about that because a stronger US dollar theoretically should help fight inflation. But there's all these other costs to it, right? And the Fed is not really worried about the global costs because they're like, listen, we have to fight inflation here in the United States. Sorry, other countries. The global economy better strap in and prepare because we're fighting inflation here in the United States of America. The dollar is just the first domino. So the Fed is also shrinking their balance sheet. So they're letting assets roll off the balance sheet. So this big giant bloated balance sheet that got really big because of the pandemic, they're like, well, we're putting this baby on a diet. What that means is that the Fed is going to no longer be a structural buyer in bond markets, right? And that means that bond markets are feeling that impact. So let's say that, you know, you were expecting $10 from your grandma every week. And if all of a sudden your grandma's like, man, no more $10, you're going to have to adjust your spending patterns because of that. The Fed is no longer the loofah of the bond market. So JP Morgan released this note that was like, we remain concerned about the lack of structural demand for treasuries, which isn't great for the functioning of the treasury market and the financing of the US government. That goes back to the point about pumpkin policy. The Fed has to step in if the treasury market becomes dysfunctional. And we saw that in action from the Bank of England. They had to step in. Berto of Piper Sandler says it will be about seven months before the treasury market pumpkins begin to rot. So there's time, but there's all these other impacts that are coming because of what the Fed is doing. Ah! And it's like, they have to do it to fight inflation, but there's all these other impacts, one of which is the US government debt. So the US government debt just hit another record, blah, oh my gosh, which is, you know, fine, I guess, inflation adjusted. But as the Fed raises rates, that does put pressure on interest payments. So there's going to be an expected $1 trillion more in interest payments from the US government. I have a short video on that on this page if you want to go see what I have to say about higher debt load for the US government, but they don't need more constraints, let's be honest. And ideally, the US government would help the Fed battle inflation, which is something that Kashari highlighted this week, helping build more housing policies around better labor market allocation, energy production, but they're just in a silly goofy mood over in Washington, D.C. There's also higher mortgage costs, right? So when the Fed raises rates, mortgage rates tend to tick up simultaneously because of what happens with treasury yields as the Fed raises rates. So mortgage rates hit 7% here in the United States with the buyer threshold much closer to 5.5%. So the price that people are comfortable paying is like five and a half percent. Mortgage rates are currently at seven percent, so really big gap there. And nearly 70% of homes in the United States have a mortgage of less than four percent, so that's the rate that they're paying. Home prices are likely to drop 10%, says Bill McBride. Rental costs are ticking down, but it's just super, super messy. OPEC, you know, they, this is not related to the Federal Reserve, but it's another constraint on everything. The EU is likely to put price caps on Russian gas, and OPEC was like, well, we don't want that to happen to us. So listen, guys, we're gonna cut production over here. We know there is a global energy crisis, but Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Our bad. And to the whole, like, we can't have green energy policy without green energy investment thing, GE is cutting jobs at their wind unit. <laughs> So that's cool. And that will likely raise costs for everybody over time. So energy is the common denominator for everything, no matter the price, um, as Japan recently showed with a $900 million loan to their top utility to buy more LNG. The UN also stepped out this week um, and was like, hey, central banks, cool your jets. Things are breaking. Things are pretty wild. There's an energy crisis. And also things are things are bad. As we know, the Fed is willing or seemingly willing to handle a little bit of breakage at this point. And of course, you know, banks are sort of watching all this and taking advantage of all this there's a you know there might be a gap in treasury markets but banks are definitely vulturing around to swoop in as things begin to shatter uh, you know goldman is going after private assets from uk pension funds which is cool because of a lack of liquidity in private markets circling back to the point about pumpkin policy the banks are going to be there to be that last drop of water in the desert when you're dying so <laughs> At least we have that. And the dollar is still really strong. So all of these second order effects from pumpkin policy, dollar dominoes, and all of that will take time to play out. Final thoughts. There's a quote that I really like. They're up their own asses with jargon. And I like that quote because when I talk to people outside of the finance industry, and usually, you know, I begin blabbering up the Fed, it becomes apparent just how many words I'm saying are like not real words. They're goofy. And I think that's most industries. But as I've repeatedly highlighted, you know, over the past few weeks, I think that finance is exceptionally bad about having very gatekept language and it impacts the effectiveness of Fed communication. And going back to the concept of the Fed prism, I think this photo and the photo says, you're so self-aware, you've become completely out of touch, underlies the whole problem with pumpkin policy. The Fed is so focused on fighting inflation, on maintaining credibility that they maybe aren't as aware or as cognizant or as thoughtful as they should be about the impact that the tipping dominoes have. And I know they've recognized it, like Lisa Cook, like they've, they've recognized it, but it's still like, oh, 
if I could just sum up all my work over the past couple, oh, like just oh, the Fed is between a rock and a hard place. Like they, they, that's like you don't have to. This is how it is. Pumpkin policy is important because the Fed is the gardener of the markets, whether they like it or not. Um, the prism is reflecting a rainbow that might need to happen to get inflation down, but it could be blinding too. And you know things are okay. Things are okay. I, the labor market is remaining strong. Tick downs in the housing market are welcome at this point, and markets are so much more resilient now than they were a couple years ago. But the thing about all of this, and it's the thing that everybody knows is that life is chess, but people, like real people, are the, the pieces being moved across the board. The 4.5% unemployment rate that Waller highlighted would be another 1.4 million people who would lose their jobs, right? And that's the frustrating part about the Fed dilemma is that the trade-offs, the that's how it has to be-isms, are so blindingly apparent. And there's this quote that I really like from The Ethics of Ambiguity, which I'll link below. Most of the things in life you truly care about are likely to be very ambiguous, and if you can't foster some ability to make a place for ambiguity, you're likely to be doomed in the act of service of its elimination, which is really a fancy and roundabout way of saying that you'll feel and suffer from anxiety much of the time. Learning to love ambiguity can be a very powerful, if rather counterintuitive, act. By love here, we're not talking about falling in love or being in love, we mean love as an act. You can learn to care for and cherish ambiguity. You can invite it into your house for a while, give it a glass of lemonade, talk with it, and listen to what it has to say to you. You'll often find things in the midst of ambiguity that you can't see or experience anywhere else. Thanks so much for hanging out. Thanks so much for spending time with me. I will be back this week, I'm sure. But if you want to go ahead and hit subscribe, share with a friend, that really helps. I'm on TikTok. This is also a newsletter and a podcast, so that'll be linked below too. TikTok, Instagram. Bye. <laughs>